I want to talk to you about stress tonight. Um, we started talking about stress last week and it's continued to be on my mind as I work to manage my own stress. Um, but even before I do that, I want to kind of give you a little background on how I got into studying um, mental health through the lens of the word. So I want to share with you the very first like mind-blowing revelation that I ever got about mental health in the Bible. And this is when I was working on my PhD. And I was at that time in my private Bible study working through the book of Romans. And so if you guys have your Bibles, grab them. If not, I'm going to read a, scriptures, a few scriptures to you. And um, I was studying Romans chapter 1 and I got stuck on verse 20. And Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says this, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. And I was so struck by that verse because even in the King James Version, which is my favorite version, which I always read, um, read from, even in the King James Version, this scripture is not confusing. It simply says that anything that God created, that we can learn something about him. It says from the, the invisible things of God, because remember the Father is invisible. We've never seen the Father. No one's ever seen the Father. He's invisible. And, but we can learn things about him based on the things that he made. So Romans 1.20 says that these things are clearly understood by the things that are made. And at the time that I was studying this chapter, I also took my first neuroscience class. And I was really excited about taking it and shocked to find out that it was hard for me. And that was a little blow to my ego because I think I'm a pretty brainy chick and I wasn't used to having a, a class challenge me like this, but that class was challenging me. Um, I just couldn't seem to grasp the concepts and the brain and it was just really hard. And then I was getting a little frustrated, I'm not gonna lie, about the evolution perspective. And I really wanted to learn more about God's creation and I was having a hard time wading through the um, biological theories of evolution and getting a little frustrated with some of the things that were being said that I knew were not including God's word in there. And so finally in frustration, I said, Lord, I really believe you led me to take this course, but if you're gonna have to help me understand it because I am not understanding it and if I can't understand it, I'm gonna drop this class. And so when I prayed that prayer, Romans 1.20 dropped in my spirit. The things that may be known of him are clearly seen in the things that are made. At the same time in the class, we were studying um, a brain structure called the amygdala. So I'm gonna give you a little biology tonight. It's gonna be good for you. The brain structure is called the amygdala. And I found out that in anatomy, mostly everything is named based on what it looks like. So when the first person cut open somebody who had passed away and saw some anatomy, they named the parts based on what they look like. So amygdala in Latin means almond. They named it almond because it looked like an almond. So I stopped right there and said, okay, Lord, I'm gonna test your word because this thing that you made looks like an almond. So I went and looked up almond in the Bible to see what almonds were in the Bible. And the very first one that came up for me was in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. You guys still with me? I know this is probably not the direction you thought I was going to go, but I want you to stay with me. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, it says this, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble and strong men shall bow themselves and the grinders cease because they are few and those who look out the windows be darkened and the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. So this is a pretty depressing passage at this point, right? Nothing's going well. And then in verse five, it says, also when they shall be afraid of that which is high and fear shall be in the way and the almond tree shall flourish and the grasshopper shall be a burden and desire shall fail. So here in this chapter, in these first five verses of Ecclesiastes 12, everything is going wrong. Everything is dying, stopping, ending, and people are struggling in this passage. I mean, if you read what's going on, everyone seems to be having a hard time. The only thing that's flourishing in this passage is the almond tree. So I thought, well, Lord, what in the world would make an almond tree flourish when all these things are going wrong? So I went back to my neuroscience book to explore what the amygdala does, the almond in our brain, and guess what? When we are stressed, or anxious or depressed intensely, guess what part of our brain activates? 
the almond in our brain. The amygdala is the organ in our brain that turns on when we are emotionally distressed. And so just like in Ecclesiastes 12, when everything was going bad, it said the almond tree flourished. It blew my mind when I saw that the almond in our brain actually moves and wakes up and gets active when everything is going bad. So exactly the type of experiences, yes, I'm a nerd, exactly the types of experiences that um, they were having in 12, Ecclesiastes 12, which is in the context of aging, but all of these hard things that are going on, the almond tree comes to life. And that part of our brain called the amygdala, which means almond, comes to life when we're emotionally distressed. And it's really important for us to recognize what the amygdala does because it is related to stress, it is related to anxiety, it is related to depression, but stress, anxiety, and depression are not exactly the same thing. And the amygdala, one of its real primary roles is how it responds to stress. And I want you to know the difference tonight then between stress and anxiety and depression. Depression, you kind of understand. If we think of that as a chronic state of sadness, which is a simplification, we get it. But a lot of times we use stress and anxiety as if they mean the same thing, and they don't. Stress is our body's response to changes and demands in the environment that require us to do something. That is what stress is. It's our body's response to changes and demands in the environment that require us to react, respond, to do something, to make a decision. Anxiety is the emotion that we have in response to stress. So everybody get that? Let me know you got that. Stress is what my body does in response to a demand. Anxiety is the emotion I feel in response to what my body does. So I really want us to focus on stress tonight versus the emotion of anxiety, because if we can deal with what's happening with the stress, which produces the anxiety, that's one of the ways to reduce anxiety. So recognizing that stress is my body response. One of the ways that I can reduce stress is for my body to be have a healthier response to processing these changes in the environment. So we're always talking about how good exercise is for us and it really is good because exercise helps our body to push out some of that negative stress response and make us calmer overall and a way that helps us not to have such an incredibly strong response to these environmental changes. In addition to that, there are foods that we eat or foods we cannot eat to help our bodies not have such strong responses. So uh, caffeine, too much caffeine gets that body all revved up and then it's not much to push it over the edge from there. So some of you guys need to cut back on caffeine. Maybe we can get down to like one cup a day and not the biggest cup they have at Starbucks. Like, can we do the little one instead of the massive one? Um, just rolling back on caffeine, would you'd be amazed at how much that would help your body um, not over respond to things because it's not already revved up by caffeine. Um, I hear you sleep in Texas, gotta get off that caffeine. I definitely um, have rolled back on caffeine heavily. There was a time when I used to drink coffee nonstop all day. I had a cup in my hand anytime you saw me and I was drinking it black, okay? Not even cream and sugar, just black coffee all day long. And I was having so many physically strong responses to stress and becoming super anxious. And I really didn't realize how much caffeine was affecting me. And one morning I woke up and there was so, my body was like shaking with stress and anxiety. And I woke up and I literally cried out, Lord, I can't take this. Like, please help me. I feel, I can't, I can't live like this. And clear as day, the Holy Spirit told me, cut the coffee, clear as day. And I stopped drinking coffee for two weeks and I could not believe how much calmer I was as a result of that and how much better I slept. And so after a while, I, I, I felt released to take one cup a day. So I try to drink just one cup a day and in the morning, so my body has time to come down off of it. So just that response could reduce your body, um, your body's response to stress, just cutting down your caffeine, um, sugar, eating healthier, exercise. But something else that can cut down on your stress response has to do with how you think about it in your own mind. Because if stress is my body's response to a demand in the environment, how I conceptualize the demands of my environment are going to help define whether something is stressful or not. And many times we're not really slowing down to be intentional about how we're, what we're engaging, what we're allowing into our space. If we just reduce the number of changes that are coming into our lives all the time, if we would narrow some things down, we don't have to be doing every single thing. We don't have to take on every single project. A lot of times we're just taking on too many things. I encourage you to prioritize and focus because different things can um, be left 
to the side. We don't have to do everything all at once. We don't have to be involved in every project all at once. We don't have to take on every opportunity that comes. Sometimes there's a lot of open doors and we don't have to walk through every single one. I want you to really learn to focus on doing what matters most in your life at this moment because everything, all things are not created equal. And so many times we're running thinking, I got to fulfill my purpose. I got to fulfill my purpose. And this opportunity is for my purpose. And this opportunity is for my purpose. And sweetie, let me tell you, um, your purpose, purpose is something that lives inside of you and that you live out. You don't have to do it in every arena, every vehicle. Sometimes it's too much. And we need to learn to say no to some stuff. No, no, no. Everybody, wherever you are, even though I can't hear you, I want you to just say it out loud. No. Because a lot of times we just don't say no. We feel like, I can't turn that down. I can't say no to that. Well, this opportunity, that opportunity, and, and the Lord's opening these doors. I need to just accept it and go through it. We'll spiritualize it. We do all kinds of stuff to avoid saying no, to avoid prioritizing, to avoid narrowing things down. You are not out of time. My husband used to say this all the time. I love it. You're not out of time and you're not out of options. And we get this lack approach to time. The same way we can approach money with lack, the same way we can approach love and relationships with a lack mindset, we can get a lack mindset when it comes to time. Like there's never going to be enough time. I'm running out of time. And it's just not the case. You are not out of time and you are not out of options. And surely because we know that the blessings of the Lord maketh rich and addeth no sorrow, honey, if you're piling on stresses saying this is you taking your purpose of God and if you're so stressed out, you can't even sleep, that's adding sorrow. And so that's not God directing it. That's you struggling with saying no to certain opportunities. And then all of these demands are on you and that amygdala revs up and your body is going berserk. And now you're anxious because of what your body is doing. And so we really have to learn to say no. And I think that one of the major reasons we struggle with saying no is because we struggle with accepting a no. I want you to think about that for a second. How do you handle it when someone tells you no? You know, we're all taught, don't take no for an answer. Keep on going. Never take no for an answer. How do you handle it when someone tells you no? How do you handle it if a friend tells you no? A family member tells you no? A job opportunity tells you no? A bank tells you no? How do you handle that? Because if you can't take no for an answer, it will be difficult for you to give no as an answer because just being in the presence of a no is so upsetting. And so I think we struggle with saying no because we don't know how to take a no. Everyone's like, oh yeah, no is a complete sentence. You should be able to say no to people. But how do you handle it when you call a friend and ask for some help and they need to say no that day? Do your feelings get all hurt? Do you get rejected? Do you start to feel rejected like someone just commented? How do you handle that no? Do you go back and say, man, just your friends aren't there for you when you need them. Who's the, who is really my friend? That's the people who are there for when I need them. And so when someone says no to us, we get offended. We don't accept their no. We're posting on our Instagram about how no is a complete sentence and if I, I need to learn to say no. But when someone comes and says no to us, when I'm the one on the receiving end of this self-care no that somebody else is putting out there, I don't want to take it. I get upset. And so if I can't take a no, it's probably a challenge for me to give a no. Because all of the emotions that are associated with someone telling me no, then I can feel guilty about doing that to someone else. And so then I'll, I won't say no because I feel so bad because I know how I feel when I hear no. So if you start to learn to take no for an answer, you'll probably get better at giving no. And it's okay, but you got to learn to take no for an answer. It will make you better at giving a no. And your stress level can reduce a great deal when you learn to accept a no and to give a no. Does that make sense to everybody? So we want to learn how to take no for an answer. You'd be amazed at how that might change your life and make you more comfortable. It's also okay when you say no to explain why you're saying no. I know that everybody says um, you don't have to explain yourself and you don't have to explain yourself. But if it makes you feel a little bit better to say, you know, I would like to say yes but I can't because I have these things going on. And if it makes you feel better to let people know why you said no, then it's okay, go ahead. Don't let the world tell you how you have to say no. The key is to be able to say, you know, no in a way that works for you. Maybe when someone tells you no, if they give you an explanation, it helps you accept it. And that's why when you say no, you like to give an explanation. Your no is yours, express it however you like. But as long as you sometimes do it, it's okay to say it the way that it means a lot to you.
Another way that you can work through saying no, if it's really so hard for you to say the word no, um, I'd like you to think about making your yes more intentional. I would like to say yes, or I can only say yes to so many things. And so I want you to be careful about how many yeses you give out and make your yeses more intentional. And so maybe you tell them, I, I can't say yes today, but I may be able to say yes next time. Isn't that a nice way to say no while using the word yes? You can do it that way if, if yes makes you happier. And I think also if that adds intentionality to your yes, I don't have a yes today, but I may have a yes in a couple of weeks if you ask me again. And if that's sincere, then that's fine. So you can turn down an opportunity using the word yes, just like the word no. Whatever works for you. I never want you to feel bound to do it the way everybody else is doing it because that's not fair. We have to be ourselves. When it's family, I see someone say, when it's family, it's harder. You're absolutely right. And this leads me to the last point that I'd like to make about stress is that we can reduce stress when we become clear about the fact that it is our choice how we respond or if we respond at all. There is no such thing as I can't and there's no such thing as I have to. I choose to or I choose not to. And very often we choose to do something because of guilt. And so you may have that call from mom or grandma or aunt or cousin, you know, they always say family makes it harder because we feel a certain responsibility to our family. And they ask us to do something and you feel bad and you say, well, if I say no, I'm gonna feel guilty, so I'll say yes. That's fine. What I ask you to do is do that on purpose. And so I want you to admit to yourself, I want you to admit to yourself, I do not want to do this, but I am choosing to do this because I would rather do it than experience guilt. It means more to me to not feel guilty than it does to make a decision based on what's good for me. And if you say that out loud to yourself and you accept it, then I'm not gonna be on your case. What I'm asking you to do is be intentional everything intentional. So if you take I can't and I have to entirely out of your vocabulary, your stress level will start to come down because the sense of control that you'll get just by saying I choose to or I choose not to will change your life because you really do have a choice every day. You don't have to choose to do anything. You don't have to get out of bed. You don't have to brush your teeth. You don't have to go to work. Now you may not like the consequences. I choose to go to work when I don't want to because I would like to pay my bills. I choose to brush my teeth because I don't want people to look at me funny when breath stinks, but it is a choice. Everything is a choice. I had a client once when I was working at a drug clinic who was homeless and he was homeless by choice. He felt that it was wrong to have to pay taxes, that the government should not touch your money. And so he refused to work a regular job and he lived in the woods. Now I'm not saying he didn't have some other mental health issues, but he was very clear that he was making a choice. You're always making a choice. When you hear yourself say, I have to girl, my aunt called, you know I have to. No, I choose to. I choose to because I value freedom from her nagging on the phone more than I value my own personal time. And just hearing yourself say that out loud might change your mind. But when we speak the truth, we can then take responsibility for it. And your stress level will probably come down quite a bit. So those are just a few things I wanted to share with you tonight. It's already 820 and I've been talking for so long. Um, but I hope you enjoyed that little quick journey through scripture with me because I really love to show you all how I get um, things from the word through the lens of the Holy Ghost and how then I could learn something about my biology from the Bible. I learned about the amygdala, understanding it through scripture, and that the amygdala is revving up my body when the environment is making a demand on me. I'm anxious in response to what my body does when I am stressed. I can reduce anxiety if I reduce stress. I can do that by taking better care of my body. I can do that by learning to prioritize. I can you do that by giving only intentional yeses. I can do that by choosing or choosing not to. And hey, just a little quick thing that I think is also really cool. Guess what? Eating almonds is good for my stress response. People who eat almonds on a regular basis have a nutritional benefit of it lowering the stress response. So almonds are good for the almond in my brain. Come on now, you can't tell me God didn't do that on purpose. 